Queer representation and gender expression in media has changed drastically over the last century. Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot came in a time of political and industrial controversy over queer themes in society, and this film tests those limits. Examining the historical context of 60 years ago when the film was released is imperative to understanding the differences and similarities between interpretations and reactions now and then. <laughs> A briefing of LGBT film history. LGBT people have been in film since the beginning of cinema. Critically acclaimed movies such as Wings in 1927 that went on to win the first ever Best Picture award at the Oscars features a kiss shared between two males. The first kiss between two women was in 1930s Morocco. The gay archetype of flamboyant sissies continues throughout film in the 20s and the 30s. Cross-dressing made its appearance too, including Sylvia Scarlet starring Katherine Hepburn, who presents as male for most of the film. Now, these portrayals, as minimal as they were, did not fly well with everyone, especially the Catholic Church, who went on to form a group called the National Legion of Decency in 1933 to condemn movies they disagreed with. Around 1934, the Motion Production Code, or the Hayes Code, was nationally enforced by media studios. The Hayes Code governed American films by censoring subjects such as impassioned or lustful acts from kissing to dancing, excessive use of alcohol, impotence, and sexual perversion, or homosexuality. This was allowed because in 1915, the Supreme Court ruled that since movies were a business, they did not have the freedom of speech. Unsurprisingly, Some Like It Hot was never given a certificate of approval from the Hayes Code administration, and was thus condemned by the Legion of Decency and was even banned in Kansas. Despite this, it was a success with the public, making the condemnation basically obsolete and contributed to the eventual death of the Hayes Code. In 2019, where gender roles are constantly challenged and audiences are quick to accuse something of malicious mockery, it's interesting that Some Like It Hot is still acclaimed as one of the greatest comedies of all time. In Wilder's film, the male protagonists Jerry and Joe are struggling jazz musicians that dress and drag to join a women's band and escape the Chicago mob. Starring alongside Marilyn Monroe as Sugar Kane, Joe and Jerry transform into Josephine and Daphne, respectively. Something about this movie speaks to audiences then and now. Through the guise of comedy, Some Like It Hot allows for the exploration of taboo themes and queer interpretations that were too bold for the time period, but would have been recognized to an open-minded audience. The movie upholds itself in that it uses the fluidity of identity less as a satirical mockery, but as a vessel of exploration and expression. As we go into a discussion on queer theory, it's easy to conclude that a viewer may be reading too much into something. Moving forward, I'd like to argue that the interesting question is not if this is what the director intended, but rather what the audience interpreted and what audiences gained from the film. With that, we move into the first question the film poses. What is the joke, and how does it work? Joe and Jerry's transformations into Josephine and Daphne is another rendition of the age-old joke of men in drag, with countless adaptations of this trope, both older and modern, that tend to produce a distasteful product. Some Like It Hot is unique in that it doesn't use its cross-dressing male protagonists for sexist jokes and empty laughs. The characters that Joe and Jerry create become experiments for the men and for the audience. By allowing this fluidity in expression, they are able to learn about themselves and teach the audience along the way. The BBC quotes, it's an anthem in praise of tolerance, acceptance, and the possibility of transformation. It's an anthem that we need to hear now more than ever. Through all the comedy the gag brings, there's a deeper resonant message to the audience saying perhaps stepping out of one's strict boundaries and societal standards could be beneficial. Now, of course, this does not mean dressing in drag and assuming a new personal identity is essential to self-discovery. Rather, the drag joke is necessary to convey the subtext that opens up the world of queer theory in this 1950s rom-com. If there's ever anything I can do for you, I can think of a million things. Subtext is implicit, unspoken themes often within a piece of writing. Some Like It Hot relies on subtext to get away with what it gets away with. Comedy is used as a distraction to those holding the conservative values of the 50s, an era still riddled with censorship. Comic relief also makes the audience more comfortable with what they are watching. If one does not want to process the subliminal messages they are receiving through the screen, they can easily redirect their attention to how funny it is that Tony Curtis is impersonating Cary Grant. Look, if you're interested in whether I am married or not... Oh, I'm not interested at all. Well, I'm not. That's very interesting. The movie opens with dialogue that immediately indicates it's going to be a film full of codes, nothing straightforward, with the first interactions of the mobsters discussing passwords. That's very refreshing. What's the password? I come to Grandma's funeral. Here's your admission card. In a brief character study, we quickly discover that none of the three main protagonists are ever entirely themselves or entirely truthful. 
Joe makes up excuses to Nellie about why he missed their date. And where were you? Where were you? With you. Me? Don't you remember you had this bad tooth and it was all impacted and his jaw was all swollen out? It was. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, right. Oh. Sugar is immediately introduced as a secret alcoholic. Joe and Jerry's function in the film revolve around creating a fictitious identity with Josephine and Daphne. With that, they thus create a story of their time at a music conservatory. And around, and we spent three years at the Sheboygan Conservatory of Music. Which is later adapted into Sugar's narrative about herself to oh, Junior. As a matter of fact, I spent three years at the Sheboygan Conservatory of Music. Joe and Jerry alone present five different people in the story, addressing very blatantly the fluidity of identity theme. The fourth player of the rom-com, Osgood, is quickly established as a queer-coded character, more akin to the gay stereotypes of earlier cinema. He mentions having been previously married many times and spending a lot of money on showgirls. That word alone insinuates facade. In addition, the actor Joey Brown is easy to be associated with more effeminate features due to the height differences between him and Jack Lemmon's Daphne. Also, this scene, just look at him. I mean, there's, there's no straight explanation for that. Osgood is the only one being 100% himself throughout the film. This can be used as an argument for the subtext as to why when Joe drives the boat, it only goes backwards, as he digs himself further backwards into something he's not. It seems to be stuck in, uh, in reverse. While Osgood has full control and goes straight forward on the boat. With these characters established, we can move on to exploring specific subtexts in specific scenes. First, take Joe and Jerry as roommates. Based on Joe's interaction with Nellie, we are to assume Joe is the more romantically inclined one. Jerry does not like this, and through the cinematography, we are able to see his reactions clearly. It happens again during Junior and Sugar's first interaction. Jerry is always left to be the one pining between the two of them, not wanting to lose this man that he's lived with for three years. I heard a very sad story about a girl who went to Bryn Mawr. She squealed on her roommate, and they found the strangled with her own bezier. Yes, we have to be very careful whom we pick for a roommate. The mm -hmm. script is later flipped when Jerry announces his engagement to Osgood, and suddenly Joe's security with his partner is threatened, and he is avidly against Jerry marrying Osgood. What are you talking oh, about? You can't marry Osgood. On the surface level, his intentions are clear. But you're not a girl, you're a guy, and why would a guy want to marry a guy? But subtext leads us to believe that there could be more feelings fostering underneath this, creating the tension. While the pining roommates might seem like a trope that doesn't fit into this, Billy Wilder went on ten years later to make The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, where he explicitly intended the homosexual subtext between Holmes and Watson, which is want, just bachelor? another roommate trope. A bachelor living with another bachelor for the last five years. Five very happy years. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. Moving on, an interesting choice at the start of the movie is Nellie's failing to mention that the job is for an all-girls band. There's something to be said in what she doesn't say. Well, it just so happens he is looking for a bass and a sax. Associating gay men to girls is a key feature in the gay archetype in earlier 20th century films, the sissies and the pansies. Moreover, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis have different takes on how they were going to portray their female personas. Lemmon decided rather quickly that he would play his with more extravagance and flamboyance. Curtis, not wanting to match this portrayal, mimicked the more prudish nature of his mother. In the end, this turned out spectacularly. Lemon's comedic style of acting complemented the flamboyance of Daphne, so it wasn't an overdone character. Meanwhile, Curtis's Josephine complimented Joe with being a more restrained figure in the pair. While it's easy to pin down Jerry as a portrayal of a more flamboyant gay man through his comfort and assimilation into Daphne, Joe slash Josephine presents another side, the closety figure, the butch. I get so closety at these family things. Butch, you get butch. Joe has much more aggressive reactions to Jerry's enjoyment in the female persona. Through, come we on, we Geraldine. He is quick to shoot down the idea of disguising in drag. And you gotta be girl. We could no, we couldn't. And repeatedly refers to the whole stunt as making Jerry unwell. What's with him? He drinks. No, but he ain't been eating so good either. He's got an empty stomach and it's gone to his head. This narrative echoes the homophobic thoughts of the time that flamboyancy and homosexuality was a disease, something to be feared. This was such a common narrative in film and other media that it made gay people hate themselves and create a system of internalized oppression. In this respect, Joe and Jerry stand on opposite sides of the spectrum of homosexuality. One of the boldest scenes of the film comes after the separated double dates between Daphne and Osgood and Junior and Sugar. Keep in mind the earlier points on Joe's jealousy and disdain towards Jerry's engagement as we break down this scene and the subtext involved. 
Control? Have I got things to tell you? What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. The first thing to notice is Jerry's full costume display during the scene. The wig is on, the Daphne voice is activated. Jerry living with his identity has allowed him this exploration that has led to this proposal. The subtext indicates that it's not just Daphne who likes it, but Jerry as well. But, I am the... but you're not a girl, you're a guy, and why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security! Okay, this is pretty funny, but it's a very empty excuse. In a society of the 20th century, despite the loads of money Jerry would reap from Osgood, two men marrying each other would be so deeply ridiculed and scrutinized in society that it wouldn't be worth it. This response comes awfully quickly from Jerry, which aside from the comedic purpose, is also a quick defense that Jerry has created. Jerry, there's another problem. Like, what are you gonna do on your honeymoon? We've been discussing that. He wants to go to the Riviera, but I kind of lean towards Niagara Falls. <laughs> the honeymoon line is crafted to make you consider the subtext as part of the comedy. It's funny to the audience that Jerry is oblivious to Joe's remarks on the blasphemous idea of two men having sex. Upon further inspection, the sentiment in Jerry's response is quite pure. In a movie that relies on sexual tension and sexual innuendos as some parts of the comedy, this is the first time one character has expressed romantic but non-sexual interest in another. Jerry isn't being stupid in this line, but rather could be interpreted as blinded by love or infatuation instead. Jerry, will you take my advice? Forget about the whole thing, will you? Just keep telling yourself you're a boy. You're a boy. I'm a boy. That's the boy. Oh, I'm a boy. I'm a, I'm a boy. I'm a... I wish I were dead. Once again, the deeper subtext is buried in the joke of juxtaposition. Earlier in the film, Joe had told Jerry to just keep repeating, I'm a girl. Just keep telling yourself you're a girl. I'm a girl. You're a girl. I'm a girl. I'm a girl. I'm a girl. In observing both these instances, we see that Joe is always giving Jerry the order that suits his best interests as far as having Jerry avoid any romantic entanglements. I'm a girl was applied to Jerry's interest in the woman on the train, while I'm a boy refers to Osgood, another man. To wrap up this scene, another note on Joe's stance throughout the whole dialogue is that it represents the mindset of the general public at the time. In a way, Joe was this movie's security when it came to the bravery of this scene. Jerry, you better lie down. You're not well. The double date night is another exploration in subtext. Oh, it's not that. It's uh, just that I'm um, harmless. Harmless? How? Well, I don't know how to put it, but I've got this thing about girls. What thing? They just sort of leave me cold. You mean like Fritchie? Well, it's more like um, a mental block. When I'm with a girl, it does absolutely nothing to me. As Junior explains his past to Sugar, there are three layers of subtext being worked. The top layer, being the most recognizable use, is the comedic subtext. The joke is that Joe is fabricating a tragic backstory to seduce Sugar. Layer two is the taboo subject of impotence, another theme banished by the Hayes Code. Joe's discussion of being numb or broken could be a symbol of a real medical condition. Third is the queer subtext, of which Joe is truly trying to use this character of Junior to unlock a heterosexuality inside of him that simply isn't there. Oh my dear, it's not your fault. Just that every now and then Mother Nature throws somebody a dirty curve. Something goes wrong inside. Though by the end of it, Joe and Sugar are passionately united, the indication of such queer subtext would have resonated and touched any queer audience member that maybe tried that themselves, or have been told to fix themselves by just searching for the right girl or guy. To complement this work going on with Mr. Shell Oil Jr., there is the whip pan to the juxtaposition of Osgood and Daphne. It's another comedic device used in defense for the movie, yet as it defends, it also informs. While this date is ridiculous, so is the level of dramaticism in Sugar and Jr.'s date. Creating both these relationships into jokes brings the symbolically queer couple and symbolically straight couple onto an even playing field. Now, it's 2019. This movie was released 60 years ago. Why are we still talking about it? As the LGBT community continues to grow in visibility and the world slowly grows in tolerance, fluidity and exploration is a message that deserves to be preached. Even if you don't think Jerry and Joe are queer characters, there's no doubt that they learned something by the end of the film, whether it was about themselves or about the world. In addition, just as the subtle queer subtext would have spoken to queer audiences of the 50s, 
The LGBT community of today is still in desperate need of substantial queer representation in TV and movies. Despite the lack of religiously bigot-driven censorship codes, mass media studios continue to stifle the appearance of queers on screens. Most recently accused of such repression is the Goliath-sized production studio of Disney. Leading up to Frozen 2, the hashtag Get Elsa a Girlfriend trend was popularized due to the want and need for queer representation in children's media, and yet nothing. Oscar Isaac, star of the newest trilogy of Star Wars films, has recently spoken up about his disappointment towards Disney for not following through with the clear romantic subtext between Poe and Finn. Personally, I, I kind of hoped and wished that maybe that would have ta taken further uh, in other films, but you know, I don't have control over that. It seemed like a natural progression, but you know, it's, it's still, uh, sadly enough, it's like a, you know, it's a time when people are too uh, afraid. Though emerging media has mostly moved on from the harmful, self-loathing queer stereotypes following the 50s, in which gay people were either to be feared or die tragic deaths, many large movie studios still shun away from the inclusion of a queer voice. Some Like It Hot appeals to both sensibilities now and in 1959. It presents a very funny rom-com that plays on societal stereotypes through the drag joke, and of course offers Marilyn Monroe to the male gaze of the audience. This is a surface level, heteronormative view of the film, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying that. There's the boldness of the film, the fact that Marilyn Monroe kisses the image of a woman and doesn't have any problem with it. The body language of attraction shared between Joe and Sugar in the scene earlier on the train. Notice Joe's sight lines. Though it was literally a male attracted to a female, the visual imagery is still progressive. Now we come to the close of the film, our four players riding into the sunset on Osgood's motorboat. The final line of this script perfectly encapsulates the message of this analysis. I'm a man! Well, nobody's perfect. Leaving the movie this open allows for interpretation past the ending for all members of the audience. It's a perfect compromise. This line encapsulates the ultimate message that the film has taught. Embracing the unknown and other perspectives will help you express new parts of yourself that ultimately creates a much more accepting and beautiful world. As Billy Wilder writes in the screenplay, but that's another story, and we're not quite sure the public is ready for it. Well, it's been 60 years and somehow we're still not ready. But what we are ready for is to explore and to play with subtext and identity and public perception. That's where we can find truths. So that's my hot take, but you know, some like it hot.